So, um, thought we'd uh, start out uh, after lunch with uh, uh, something different, a palate cleanser. Um, we've been very careful uh, with Empirical Educator Project, um, get a lot of questions. Uh, hey, are you going to do expand internationally? Are you thinking about K-12, so on and so forth? And we'd love to think about all of those things, um, but we again, we want to grow usefully. Um, so we're trying to maintain a, a, a focus um, in the short term that allows us to be useful. But at the same time, um, we want to deliberately keep our understanding of what the Empirical Educator Project can be in the long term a little bit unstable. Um, we want to uh, keep you thinking about what this could be, um, even as we focus on what we need it to be right now. Um, so for that reason, I wanted to uh, talk uh, with my friend uh, Chuck Jubin from University of Central Florida uh, about a project that he brought me down to see um, this year. Um, and some work that University of Central Florida has been engaged with in partnership uh, with uh, a community uh, in uh, Orlando called the Tangelo Park um, and a foundation there called the uh, Rosen Family Foundation. Um, and um, this is, uh, I mean, there are a number of different lenses that you can look at this with. Um, one is uh, pre-K through 12 empirical education. Um, uh, another is uh, sort of uh, community development. Um, and a third is um, the university's place-based uh, engagement um, and sense of responsibility. Um, and I think uh, all three of those uh, are appropriate. Um, so um, there's a lot to hear, here to cover, as there is with a number of these talks. So I'm gonna, just going to jump right in, Chuck. Um, why don't we um, start by talking, uh, start at the beginning. Um, so um, uh, the Rosen Family Foundation, founded by the philanthropist Harris Rosen, um, was looking to engage with a community to do some good in the Orlando area. Um, why don't you start by telling us when when did that start? Um, what were they looking to good to, to do, and um, how did the Rosen Foundation and uh, the Tangelo Park community find each other? Well, first of all, is this on? Yes. Is it on? Good. Let me compliment you. Great presentations this morning. You stretched my roots and twisted my vectors with all these great things that you've done today. Yeah. The, the statisticians get that. Um, so the Rosen Foundation and Tangelo Park, I guess I'll start from the beginning, 25 years ago. Back 25 years, if you were at one of the Disney hotels on International Drive in Orlando and you had a habit, and you needed a little bump. And the bellhop had the look. So you would talk to the bellhop and say, where can I go get a little something? And he would send you to Tangelo Park, which was predominantly African-American community tucked in right behind the high-end International Drive. Tangelo Park was amazing in the 25 years ago. It was a dangerous place. Drug dealers everywhere, on every corner. I started 25 years ago, and I have the look. And I was approached by a lot of drug dealers. Okay, okay. Park my car to light, and they come out from either side of the convenience store. The principal, Bob Allen of Tangelo Park Elementary School, told his teachers, go home immediately. Go home immediately after school. Get out. Okay, get out. He would watch drug deals going on out his window. He would police the elementary school playground for paraphernalia every morning. The school would be broken into on a regular basis, two o'clock in the morning, he'd have to go down. 
That was Tangelo Park 25 years ago. However, these are wonderful people. They began marching. They began with bullhorns. They did everything they could to drive the drug dealers out. Rosen, Harris Rosen, who's a self-made billionaire in Orlando, said, I want to give something back. I want to do something. So we called Mabel Butler, the commissioner, and she said, I'll be right down. And they went to Tangelo Park. And she said, what do you want to do? He said, well, I'd like to give college scholarships to this community. And she said, that's not enough. You have to adopt the community. You have to work with the community. You have to work with them, not to them. So here's what he wound up doing. Every student 25 years ago in Tangelo Park, beginning at two years of age, gets a free quality education that continues all the way through elementary, through middle, through high school, supported all the way. Um, when they graduate from college, they get a full scholarship, room, board, tuition, to any state university in, uh, in the state of Florida, full ride paid. Books too. Huh? Books too. Books, everything. Everything. Paid. Books. Transportation. Forever. As long as the community exists. As long as the community exists. Um, so, to date, Tangelo has been running for 25 years. So, I'm going to say this to you. A lot of times we do things, we have a solution looking for a problem. This is a very interesting kind of thing because people have said over the years, when I talked to Rosen, he said, I don't want any data. You know, this is just the right thing to do. I don't want any data. And then the program began getting noticed. And then Rosen said to me, I need data. Mm. All right. I need, huh? oh, oh, hold on. Okay. Hold on. Oh, 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 Michael. <laughs> We're going to get to the data. Let's, let's tell a story here. All right. All right. So, so because I, I want to, um, first of all, uh, let, let's talk. You started to talk a little bit about, the, um, about what the community brought to the table. And I, I think it's important to note, we had originally talked about doing a half-hour um, um, session and bringing up a member of the Tangela Park community and a member okay. of the Rosen Foundation. And for reasons we won't go into, the, time, the, the group, your group just decided the timing wasn't right for that. Um, uh, but I, I would like to talk a little bit more, first of all, about um, the, the, the way in which that, uh, the Rosen Foundation and the community engaged in those early years to the present, uh, because I think that, that's important to the process. Can you talk a little bit about that, that engagement process and also a little bit about um, what, what that um, pre-K uh, and program in particular looked like? Sure. I'll talk whatever you want. Uh, um, engagement is very interesting. So Harris Rosen went to the Baptist church and explained this to the community. And you know what the res their response was? Who the hell is this guy? What does he want? What's he trying to do? And the next hand that went up said, my child is two years of age. You mean they have to wait 18 years before the program starts? He said that they know. Any student who lives in this community who graduates from high school this day will get a scholarship. So we started it immediately. That was the engagement. It takes a while to be trusted in the community. You have to be there. You have to be there all of the time. We have no bureaucracy, nothing. We have no organizational chart. We have no CEO. Nobody is paid. We're all volunteers. The treasurer's report is once a month in a community meeting. That's when we meet and make all of our decisions. The, community, the treasurer's report is, I'll pay the bills. Don't worry about it. And, and who shows up at those meetings? The community shows up. I show up. People from the university show up. And the community shows up and Rosen shows up. He's a philanthropist who shows up every day. He is there for every meeting, every meeting. Yeah. And um, it's terribly empowering for the community to make decisions about, you know, 
Posner is an interesting guy because lots of people now sort of sneak their way into Tangelo to get a scholarship, and they live with their neighbors, you know, and there's an eligibility committee, and they say, well, you don't live in the community, so you're not eligible, and Rosen says, oh, yeah, they are. Just give them a scholarship. Give them a scholarship. Yeah. Okay? That's how you engage, but you have to stay. You have to stay, you know. So it is not a three-year funding cycle, and we'll talk about talking to other funders in a minute. Yes, we will. So could you describe the, how the, the pre-K program works? Ah, it works two ways. The pre-K program is in houses in Tangelo. Community owners were trained, certified, and there are six children in a home in Tangelo in a class. And it works beautifully because one, it's employment for the people in the community, and two, they're trusted members of the community who are teaching their children. It really, really does work beautifully. And, and what, what has the university's role been in all of this? Whatever, whenever, whatever you want, however you want, I am not an ivory tower. That's the university's role in this, whatever you need. For instance, um, parents in a community like Tangelo are uncomfortable with schools. They've not had a particularly good experiment in, in, uh, experience in schools. So one of their strategies is to go in and immediately start confronting the school. We, we instituted a parent leadership program and taught them how to negotiate for their children. We actually taught them the public school lingo so they're not overwhelmed by it. They're not intimidated by it. And it's very interesting to watch a parent now say, oh, you have an IEP for my student? Shall we go over that? Oh, I see they're in the 75th percentile. Shall we talk about that? They can speak the language of school. Terribly empowering. And many of the parents who have gone to the parent leadership program that we run go on to get their GEDs, and several have gone on to get their college degrees. So, so now, um, let's talk a little bit about the data. I love data. Okay. Yeah. So, so tell, tell us a little bit about where Tangelo started and where it is now in terms of the data. When Rosen finally said, I want data, I had to do a lot of backfilling. You know, don't do that again. <laughs> don't do that. Um, and in talking to potential funders, they said, we need data. We need data. And talking to a lot of potential funders for programs like it, we don't want any money. We want someone else to do it. Uh, they kept saying, we want more data. We want more data. We want more data. And I realized very quickly that was a euphemism for we don't want to do this. We don't want to do this because it's 25 years as long as the community exists. The data. When we started in Tangelo, high school graduation was 40%. Today it is 100%. Every kid who lives in Tangelo Park who goes to high school graduates. Once in a while, there's a drop. You have to remember, we've talked about a lot of high-level things here this morning, right? You have to remember you're dealing with teenagers. You know, you're dealing with teenagers. <laughs> you know, it's like the other day a teenager said to me, Dr. Chuck, I didn't go to work today. I was tired. I said, oh, you were tired. I am so sorry. I hope you get better soon. Or they will go to college and say, oh my God, I've got all this time off. I only have classes on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Oh, do you? Uh-huh, you have a lot of leisure time. I see. Let's have a chat about that. 100% um, high school graduation rate, okay? All right. Oftentimes, people want the wrong metrics. You know the old adage from Kahneman? Okay? You can't measure what you want to, so you measure what you can. Okay. What they want you to do, they ask you this question. How many graduated from high school? How many took the scholarship? How many went to college? How many graduated? Divide. Okay, it's the wrong metric. It's absolutely the wrong metric. What is the problem in this country? If you live in the lower economic quartile, the chance of you graduating from college probabilistically is 10%. The odds against you are 10 to 1. Okay, so in Tangelo, of the 400 high school graduates we've had so far, the expectation would be 40 college graduates. We have 150 college graduates. 
We have 216 college degrees. We have 35 graduate degrees. Those students who remain in Tangelo, live in the community, go to a four-year school, either directly or through community college, graduate at a rate of 78%. Okay, that is the correct metric for measuring the success of a program. That, you know, that, that's what it is. Crime rate in Tangelo is down 78% over 25 years. The sheriff said the other day, uh, now Mayor Deming said, Tangelo is an oasis. There's virtually no violent crime in Tangelo at all. It's an amazing turnaround. You just have to stay with it. Now you have to ask me some questions. How much money was invested Ask me the damn question. How much money was invested? Thank you, huh? Michael. <laughs> Thirteen million. Thirteen million in twenty-five years. That's a lot of money, but in terms of thirteen uh, div uh, tw div twenty-five. Wait, twenty-five divided by thirteen. Thirteen divided by twenty-five. You're Carnegie Mellon. You, you do the math. I, that's not me. That was a philosophy now, major. Now there are all kinds of interesting side effects in terms of this. The spending patterns. Two two primary spending patterns. Um, preschool and college scholarships. Interestingly, five years into the program, it inverted. More money is being spent on the preschool program than for the scholarship. Rosen freaked out. Why is this happening? Aren't they going to college? Why is it happening? Because they're getting other scholarships. They're getting other scholarships. They're learning how to apply for them. The counselor's helping them do it. So what's happening is the Rosen program has become a safety net for them. They don't get anything. He pays it all. He pays a difference, OK? Crime rate is down. So how are we doing? Oh, we're good. So we said this program is so good. By the way, I have all the data. It's right there in the folder. And you can just email me. I'll send you all the data, all the data you want, OK? So. <laughs> Interestingly enough, and the preschool kids, they do remarkably well when they get to elementary school. Some of these kids coming into the school didn't know the color green. They'd never seen a triangle. Okay, can you imagine what that would be like to start kindergarten that far behind? You can't, you can't ever make that up, ever. So we started going to other funders. And what did they say? More data. They always say more data. But they said something else. Oh, you know what they said, ROI. We, we have to see a return on investment for this. What are we going to get for our money? Do you know how hard it is to find an economist to do an ROI study on this? And I found one. Lance Lochter at the University of Chicago, and he did it. You know, it's there. It's in there. It's in the report. You can have it. Warning, it was written by an economist. Okay. <laughs> But the return on investment, conservatively, is seven to one, back to society, based on reduced crime rates, early childhood ed education, and college scholarship graduation. Seven to one. So I think you know why I wanted you to hear this now. Um, let me just say two things in wrapping. First, um, uh, K-12 is kind of the family business for me. Um, my parents and sisters are all in it. Um, I learned how to read a school community almost before I learned how to read. Um, and when I came down to visit the Tangelo Park community, my first reaction was, this is a community where I'd be proud to raise my own kids. Um, the, the, you know, the, the care um, my, my parents are both first generation college students and the, the care and energy there is just, just fantastic. So I won't say more than that. Um, I don't think there's really more than that to say. That's really the highest compliment I can think of to pay to a community. Um, but the other thing, um, we could go down the rabbit hole of uh, funding for this kind of program and how it works um, or doesn't work. Um, what I want to say is um, I think there's a real opportunity um, for universities as place-based organizations that already have foundations and relationships uh, with their communities and relationships with funders um, and expertise to be um, mediators the way University of Central Florida uh, has been 
We already have in this room a number of great candidates for that. We have a number of Pittsburgh-based universities. Uh, uh, Chuck shared with me um, an, an article, uh, a, a, a study about some work that Duke did a number of years back. Uh, we have uh, uh, Coppin State in Baltimore. Uh, we have, I'm sure there are universities here that I'm, I, you know, I'm not thinking of at the moment who are, are excellent candidates. Um, so uh, now you know who, Chuck. Um, and if you're interested, uh, please come find him. Uh, Chuck, if, if, if there are questions um, that you want people uh, to come to you with? Anytime, anywhere, any place. Okay. Uh, I just want to say in terms of resources, do you know what the total collective university endowment in this room is? I calculated it. You know, it's over $65 billion dollars in endowments, university endowments in this room. Uh, and I'll just say one thing. Um, in terms of this, there are so many models that would make this work. Uh, just think of the National Football League funded one of these in every one of their franchise cities in the National Basketball League and that, you know, the National Hockey League uh, in terms of doing this. It is a minuscule investment for an amazing amount of good that's done for young people. You know, college, college degrees worth a lot of money to people. You know, it raises them from poverty to the middle class. You're a great audience, far above average. <laughs> Thank you, John.